do you know about Russia, right? What do you know about Trump Russia? Well, you know, and I'm a Cold War product. And as a product of the Cold War, I grew up with the KGB everywhere in my operations. In fact, I started out as a Russian linguist in the Navy, uh, and they thought that it would be better served, served if I took a language that was more suited to my complexion, which in fact, although it sounds a little racist, and it was at the time, it really worked out for me. Um, black guy uh, who speaks Arabic was my middle name for 20 years. So uh, literally every agency out there has borrowed me at some point for, for operations. So not a bad thing. But um, I wrote two books in this last two years on the Trump-Russia scandal, on the, uh, the Russian actions against the United States. In fact, my first book, for anybody who doesn't know, was called The Plot to Hack America. Uh, and that book came out five weeks before the election. In fact, I started writing it on the 25th of July. I turned it in, the manuscript in, the publisher on 3 September, and it actually went online print uh, by, by my publishing house on September 23rd, 2016. I, ironically, the Central Intelligence Agency started working on an identical report that came out and was delivered to President Obama on the same day, September 23rd, 2016. Uh, and it's funny because we almost wrote the exact same two reports. Now, the only difference is they had a bigger staff, they had access to top secret information. And I'm often asked in the news media, how could you write a book so fast, so comprehensive about the Trump-Russia scandal when everybody was too busy reading Hillary Clinton's emails? Well, it's simple. I'm not a journalist, okay? <laughs> I don't have to live up to their standards. I am a spy, right, or an ex-spy. And what we do is we can aggregate information and balance it off the details of our career experience. And when I saw the information uh, that was, we, was being collected about the DNC hacking and the entities that were handling it to me, it struck me as something that I had seen before in my career. And I said, you know, this is really an old school KGB type operation. And I sat down and I quickly sketched out what had to be in place and what the objectives of the, the hacking were. And it's simple. Nobody takes a shot at the United States on this level without having the KGB officer in chief, Vladimir Putin, uh, giving the orders. And so I hashed that all out in the book, uh, got that book published. And ironically, like I said, the Central Intelligence Agency and Director of National Intelligence were writing the exact same story, and they came out on the exact same day. In fact, I had an objective, in uh, a goal, in the end of my book where I said the president needs to make a prime time speech with the director of national intelligence and the director of homeland security uh, in order to warn the nation about this attack. That was one of my recommendations. Two weeks later, President Obama made a primetime speech <laughs> with the same thing. And, you know, that was an easy call. Everybody knew the president was going to do that. But what we seem to have missed during all of that time as, as U.S. citizens is the fact that, you know, what has actually happened to us was the, the elections weren't hacked. It was the mindset of the American public that was hacked. And the Russians understood that they could take information and use information against us. And in fact, uh, I like to characterize it this way. They weaponized freedom of speech and they took our ability to get unfiltered information, which we would have to process, and they manipulated it to the point where right now one third of our nation flat out refuses to believe anything that comes from the objective news media. They literally will deny empirical evidence in front of their face, right? And uh, as, in fact, I was just at a conference in Los Angeles called Politicon, uh, where I was on a panel with Bill Crystal, and uh, Bill Crystal, who is a never Trumper, uh, still a conservative, was not convinced that information warfare was a deciding factor in this election, and I got pretty mad. <laughs> in fact. I said that very thing. I shouted at him. I said, one third of the country would not believe a damn word that's being said in this room. If it were a ton of bricks and it fell on them, they would call them fake bricks, right? 
So we are in a, a, a fight that I can only characterize uh, that once again, we are in a fight for the soul of our nation and the belief as to whether facts and information and data that appears before your eyes is real has been made an arguable point. And that arguable point I detail more in my next book called the, that I already published. It's a New York Times bestseller. It was on the Times bestseller list for eight weeks in the middle of the summer reading uh, season, which is pretty amazing because plot to destroy democracy, uh, how Putin and his spies are, are damaging America and dismantling the West. That's the name of the book. That book is a pretty scary book. I'll just be straight up and say it. Um, I read it for the first time uh, just before I went on Bill Maher and started talking about it. Uh, and, you know, it's different. When you write a book, that's different from reading your book, right? So I actually sat down and read it from end to end, and I terrified myself. I mean, I literally scared myself to the point where in interviews I'd say, don't read this thing at night because you will worry all night about the data that we, we have, the facts as they exist. Um, and it's some, we're in a very scary world. And right now we are 14 days from being even more scary. So in summary, what did I write in Plot to Destroy Democracy? It's very simple. The Russian strategic plan for what's happening to us today and why they, co they worked with Donald Trump, his campaign, and created the character of Donald Trump as president who did not believe in any of the things any president has ever believed in before. And that's what makes him exceptional. Not that he is just an idiot, not that he is just phenomenally ignorant of even the fundamentals of history or science or any of the things that every president was a master of. It's the fact that he was an empty vessel and he was, had only one thing that he desired above all else. And that was he wanted to be in the global, how can I put it, the global oligarchy. He wanted to be one of the global elite who had a yacht that had, you know, carports for other yachts inside it. And Trump is not very rich. That's something that is going to come out relatively soon. Donald Trump may, in fact, he inherited $250 million from his father uh, when his father passed away. But in fact, he may be as far deep as half a billion dollars in debt to both Russia and, and Chinese creditors. Uh, when Deutsche Bank last year was subpoenaed by the special counsel, this is the only bank in the world that loaned money to Donald Trump. No one would loan money to Donald Trump. And so, you know, about Donald Trump's taxes, people always ask me about his taxes. Look, when the special counsel has subpoenaed your bank for its loans to you, it's pretty sure they have your tax returns already. So for the most part, Donald Trump was this empty vessel until he went to a meeting at the Nobu restaurant during the Miss Universe pageant, and he had a two-hour private, unrecorded uh, sit-down with the 12 richest men in Russia, including a personal representative of Vladimir Putin. And when Donald Trump came out of that meeting, this was the party line he started spouting. NATO, bad, must be dismantled. The European Union was, which is bizarrely, he believed was designed and built to damage the United States economy, which is just weird. And, and that all alliances the United States had built since the end of World War II were bad, including every one of our major trade agreements. It's bizarre. Look, I'm, look I come from the intelligence community, right? And we have this, you know, it, we, we, we trade in secret information, but we generally analyze using common sense, right? Or as we like to say, common sense is the least used intelligence analysis tool. So that, that being said, when I look at what he says, we always look for a terminal objective, and we always process that through the, you know, the, what we call the Whiskey Five Hotel. Who, what, when, where, why, how, right? W, you know, five W's and, a, and, a, and an H, Whiskey Five Hotel. 
But the one, one question we are always most interested in, whether it's a jet that moves from Vladivostok to Smolensk, whether it's artillery shells being transferred from Pyongyang out to some remote artillery battery on the northeastern North Korean coast, or whether it's uh, you know Libyan Coast Guard vessels getting underway at two in the afternoon instead of six in the morning, whatever that is, that event that we're looking at in the world, we don't care about the the who, what, when, and hows. That's easy. That's just data. It's why. That's what we're always interested in. Why is this event occurring? If it's just a routine patrol and the guy has his engines damaged, we're going to figure that out. And that's what we'll get it. That's why. If the artillery shells are moving to the North Korean coast for a fire, you know, an annual fire exercise, then that why is what we want to know. So that's how we process information. But it literally all comes down to why. And so when you look at the Trump-Russia scandal. You look at what's going on with Donald Trump. We get some very interesting whys out there. Right? You start looking at this data, it's like, why does this man want the destruction of the European, you know, the Atlantic Alliance, right? The relationship between the United States and Europe and European capitals as, a, as, a act, as an organizational um, wall against Soviet communism or Russian, you know, hegemony anywhere. Well, in his world, that should not exist. And when that comes up, everybody in my world starts going, okay, why do you suddenly believe this? Two weeks ago, you know, or two years ago, Donald Trump, uh, before he went into that meeting at the Nobu restaurant, he never talked about foreign policy other than saying Barack Obama's doing it wrong, I hate Barack Obama. Okay, we understand that part. You don't like the man. He called you out, uh, he made you look like a fool. But for him to say the, the Atlantic Alliance, North Atlantic Treaty Organization should not exist, they're a bunch of deadbeats, we need to get money from them, I think that we're obsolete. And he actually told uh, the ambassador to Sweden, no, not the ambassador to Sweden, the president of Sweden, uh, there's an anecdote that came out about two months ago where the president of Sweden was meeting with Donald Trump and the president of Sweden had to inform Donald that Sweden was not a member of NATO, that they just participate and coordinate with NATO just in case they need to work with the alliance in their defense. And do you know what Donald Trump said? He said, yeah, that's what I want the United States to do. Now, the United States created NATO, okay? <laughs> That's like saying, I built my house, and I don't want to live in it. I just want to be an Airbnb renter. Let me get rid of my mortgage and go live in a house that I rent. That's just absolutely ridiculous. And in my world, the intelligence world, the why question comes up again. Why would you say that? Now, I believe that that was a moment that Donald Trump was, was being very honest with us. Very honest. He wasn't being honest with us at all. He was being honest to the president of Sweden or prime minister of Sweden who had to tell the U.S. press that this is what Donald Trump says because Donald Trump does not talk to the U.S. press, which is another interesting why, right? Why do you try to tamp down transparency? Why do you hate freedom of the press? All of these things are interesting little questions that led me to write a 400-page book about Donald Trump and, and Russian strategic objectives in the West. And that led me to my, my conclusion, which is in the title, that there is, in fact, a plot to destroy democracy. There really is. And the, the best part about it, you don't, have to, you, don't, you, don't, you don't have to fake it. I mean, they are saying this in public. They are saying this and taking actions which every one of you can see. A good example is, uh, Julia, you're in, you're in Austria, if I'm not mistaken. The government of Austria is a government that is fundamentally was formed on an old Austrian party that was established by two ex-World War II Nazis from the, the Austrian branch 
of the Schultzstaffe, the SS. And it now has transformed itself into this far right-wing conservative party that is funded by Moscow. Now you have, and here's the best part, right after they won the election, they sent a delegation to Moscow to bind themselves with, with Putin's United Russia Party. And then they sent a delegation to Washington to sit down with Steve Bannon, Mike Flynn, and Donald Trump to create an alliance between the United States, this far-right Austrian party, and Moscow. And all of these activities, I'm sorry, all of these actions that we're seeing throughout the world, I don't know if you can see my camera, sort of dropped away, they all seem to have a universal theme. And that universal theme is one which Vladimir Putin made clear internally in Russia years ago. That, the, that is actually an old communist objective from when he was a KGB officer. That capitalist Western democracies are an impediment to any other ideology in this world. And the only way that you can get your ideology forwarded, whether it's communism or now in Putin's Russia, uh, which is, you know, autocratic, you know, autocratic, autocratic oligarchy, right? Or as he, as he, he uses it, he uses Tsar Nicholas the first ideology of nationalism, orthodoxy, autocracy, right? And you add oligarchy to that for Putin. Then if that is your objective, is that your nation state should be an oligarchy that is led by an autocrat, which Benito Mussolini called fascism, right? Uh, and what Mussolini defined as fascism, right, was a dictatorship of the far right, of the corporate far right. Uh, so if you want that, well, the one thing that is going to stand in your way is going to be democracy, which is free will, free, free speech, free rights, and the right to choose your representatives and give them redress. That being said, an autocrat like Vladimir Putin is definitely not going to like that because he had just fought throughout his entire career from the day he was born to the day that he left the KGB. He, is th he was a hardcore communist who believed in communism. And then he was forced to become a capitalist, but he believed in a centralized government and a society which is in Russia, extremely conservative and extremely religious, Orthodox, Russian Orthodox and conservative. And they do not believe in the values that we believe in, like giving the rights, the equal rights to gays, lesbians, transgenders, minorities, and anybody else that isn't white, right? And they, during the late or you know, the, the early 2000s, became sort of a um, sort of heroes to um, heroes to um, the American conservatives in the United States. So that being said, if they were heroes to the conservatives in the United States, the Russians figured out very quickly that they could co-opt these Americans. And over a 10 year period, starting in 2010, they did just that. The first group to go down was a group called the National Organization of Families. And they were a right wing Christian conservative group that believed in that gay marriage would be the death of the American family. And they found that Russia and Russians were a friendly place for them to go. And every year they started running a conference in Russia called the Protection of Christianity Conference. And that conference for 10 years, it's now been heavily attended. And Franklin Graham, all right, the head of you know, the Christian coalition there, Franklin Graham is one of the biggest followers. And he is a great admirer of Vladimir Putin. Next, they started co-opting the groups in the United States who were believers in guns. And you might have heard about a young woman by the name of Maria Butina. Uh, a, she was a furniture saleswoman in Vladivostok in, in, in Siberia and then disappeared from the scene. Two years later at age 23, shows up with a man by the name of Alexander Torshin, a uh, former minister in the Russian government. And they are running a group called Right to Bear Arms in Russia, which has no right to bear arms. And, but that organization put all of their emphasis on meeting members of the National Rifle Association in the United States. And it is now believed that it was a Russian intelligence operation 
Maria Butina has been arrested and is in custody right now as an unregistered foreign agent, which is FBI talk for a person we are about to charge with the Espionage Act. So it appears that that operation was designed to use a pretty Russian woman as a honey trap for a bunch of old white guys with guns by showing her with guns and making them believe that Russia would support their objectives. She got so close to Donald Trump, she actually was the first person to ask him a question at a conference in, in Las Vegas. And the question she asked was, what are the relations with the United States going to be, with Russia going to be, and will you lift sanctions on the Russian billionaires who are under sanction? Which is what this is really all about. It's really about Vladimir Putin and his cronies getting their illicit stolen billions of dollars that they got from breaking down and stealing everything that wasn't nailed down when the Soviet Union dissolved. That money went into real estate all around the world. For those of you who live in Germany, you might know Baden-Baden. That was a big place, pleasure place of the czars in the 19th century. They just bought that city back. They own Baden-Baden, right? Same thing with the, with the coast of Monaco and high-level real estate in Florida and New York City. And when Barack Obama imposed sanctions after the invasion of Crimea, they lost the access to those banking around those assets. And so we're talking hundreds of billions of illicit corruption money that has now been frozen by the United States. And when Donald Trump had his secret meeting at the Nobu restaurant in 2013 at Miss Universe pageant, that was one of the subjects that was discussed, raising the sanctions. So technically, it was the oligarchs of Russia and Vladimir Putin, a former KGB agent that co-opted Donald Trump, convinced him that their beliefs were his beliefs, that he was a part of their base, and that he would be joining the exclusive billionaire boys club that has, you know, yacht, yacht garages in their yachts, and that he could be part of the global elite rich, because he's not. And that was a motivating objective for Trump. But the Russians aren't stupid. You never rely on one man who doesn't even know, how, know where Russia is on a map. They put into motion a strategic information warfare operation, which magnified everything Trump said and all of their opinions that would motivate Americans who would support Trump. And that phrase that they actually have an intelligence manual for this. And there is the NATO Information Warfare Manual, which you can get on the Internet, outlines all of their objectives and how they do it. And they call this meta narrative framing. They put a frame around Donald Trump and all of his supporters, and they injected information which would only support that frame or only harm people in events outside of that frame. So that you would only believe what was inside that little box. And anything outside of that little box, you would characterize that as fake news, false, to the point where it would literally brainwash you. This is a very, very old Kremlin methodology that has been used since 1917. Russian propaganda, you, for those of us who are old enough, you might remember the Soviet newspaper was called Pravda, which was Russian for the truth which universally outside of Russia was known as the lie, right? No one believed Pravda. Anything that came from the Etar Tass news agency was like, you know, was almost as, as, as reliable as Daffy Duck cartoons. So no one believed that. And Russia saw that they needed to change that when they became a capitalist country. So they started creating their own news organizations to challenge American news and global news on the world stage including Russia Today, which is the biggest megaphone of lies, second only to Fox News, uh, which puts out their crafted intelligence products uh, to the world like it's a legitimate news organization. Same with Sputnik, Russia Today, TASS news agency still exists, Izvestia, all of them. It comes from Russia. You can be pretty sure it's a lie because they have a centralized government. And that centralized government has figured out how to weaponize information. And 
the best place to try it on is stupid Americans, which is what they did. They weaponized the, the racism and beliefs and, and xenophobia of American citizens, and they amplified it to the point where you would only hear things you agreed with, right? And you would filter out everything you didn't agree with. The Russians actually call this in their Russian intelligence manuals, perception management, where they create your world and you live in it. Donald Trump has taken this to the nth degree. And in fact, I actually wrote this in my book. I said that there's a rat in the White House. And that sounds like that stands for Russian autocrat advisory team. Because Donald Trump, his methodologies are so fine. They match Moscow so closely that, you know, it's, it's like that joke Trevor Noah said on The Daily Show, that Donald Trump ran and won the presidency by saying he was going to run as the Manchurian candidate on the platform that he's the Manchurian candidate. <laughs> right? Vote for me, I'm a traitor. But the meta-narrative framing was so effective that every person that sided with Trump would believe every lie that he said. NATO was bad suddenly to all these tens of thousands of people who fought in the Cold War, including hundreds of generals who sided with him, suddenly hated NATO. That the European Union, the largest trading bloc that the United States had in the world, was suddenly bad for the U.S. economy. Okay? And that, whoops, I'm sorry. And that our trade pact, sorry, I have to hold my own phone up here. Um, that our trade pacts, including one which would give us access to every nation in the Pacific Rim at trading um, uh, with protocols that would favor the United States market, right? NAFTA, I'm um, not NAFTA, um, the uh, TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, was bad. He pulled out of it and surrendered the entire Asian global market to China. Oh, and suddenly, by the way, Canada's bad, right? Moscow and North Korea are good. This is what I'm saying about meta narrative framing. Donald Trump has been read by people who really do this for a living. That was the Russian intelligence, you know, psychologists and career intelligence officers. And they realized that that man could be turned. Now, I don't mean turned like he is an American who is a traitor, okay? You generally start out, and, and, and the CIA director, um, both Mike Hayden and John Brennan, both are pretty convinced that Donald Trump started out as what the Soviets used to call a useful idiot. That's a person who doesn't know what he's doing, but he does things that are in your interest, and he's not quite sure whether he cares or not, whether you, whether you believe it. But for the most part, you, trans you progress from useful idiot to what we call an unwitting asset. That's where you know someone is benefiting from your behaviors, but you're not, you're not aware of who that person is directly. And then we believe that on July 27, 2016, when he said, Russia, if you're listening, please release Hillary Clinton's 30,000 stolen emails, Donald Trump became known as a witting asset, which is where he knew damn well where all of this is coming from, and he knew how it would benefit him. Now, that is one step below a traitor. A traitor is a person we call an agent. An agent is a person who is a paid contracted individual. And we do the same thing. Okay. We get people to sign contracts knowing that they work for our intelligence agencies. I don't believe that. I believe Donald Trump is a winning asset. And he is very well aware of where all the benefits are coming from. And in fact, he may in fact be in debt to Vladimir Putin because the way he speaks about him you should all hope that your spouse someday looks at you in the way that Donald Trump looks at Vladimir Putin. So that is what the plot to destroy democracy is about. And in fact, those of you who are living in Europe, you are already under the, you are already under the yoke in many places. You're seeing these alt-right and right-wing groups rise up. Uh, for those of you who lived in Norway, uh, you might remember a man by the name of Anders Bering Brevik, young guy who went and massacred 69 children on the island of Utoya, outside of Oslo. Um, Brevik had an interesting fact, and an interesting statement that I'm going to end this, this, uh, this webinar with. The reason that he mass murdered all those children was because he said he wanted to eliminate 
the next generation of liberal leaders from Norway. Breivik was the equivalent to the alt-right in Europe, and they exist everywhere. Pegida in Germany, uh, you know, these, these new right-wing parties that are cropping up everywhere with their little Hitler youth groups. He admired Putin. He admired all of the American neo-Nazis and alt-right and anti-Islamic, uh, uh, um, you know, demagogues in the United States. But it was the fact that he took action and decided the only way to solve that liberal problem was to kill it. We're not at that point yet, but what, the point we are at right now is we may, in fact, be two weeks away from the last free and fair election in the United States. I do not say that and take that lightly. If Donald Trump and the right wing do not maintain control of Congress, you will have the circumstance that, that John Adams never believed would happen. He said, we always believed that someday there would be a tyrant that would become president. But he also believed that Congress would be there and the guardrails of democracy would be there to put any tyrant in check until he's removed from office. Well, we never thought that we would have a Kremlin-like Politburo rubber stamping everything that the tyrant does. So we will be moving away from democracy if this election is not won by the opposition, by, by the Democrats and the independents who stand for the Constitution. We will move directly to autocracy in the American experiment, which was, I'm in Philadelphia. I'm only 10 blocks away from Independence Hall right now. I was born in this city. I take this very personally. We have fought and bled and died and worked and strived for America to always be moving forward. This may be where we move laterally, completely away from a real democracy, but they'll keep the Constitution, but they'll just elect selectively determine who the laws apply to, and one tribe will dominate all. It will not be e pluribus unum from many one. It will be e pluribus, screw the rest of you, right? So... <laughs> What we need to do is we need to turn out the vote. For those of you who are overseas, I have one thing I want to say, and we found this out in both London and Paris. There are American high schools where you are. You need to turn out the 18 to 29-year-old vote. They said in this election, they project only 16% of millennials between 18 and 29 will vote this, this election. And that that is the one block of American citizens who could completely change the face of this election. Hillary, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Michelle Obama has a great video out where she says, do you want your grandmom determining what you wear out to the disco? Do you want your crazy uncle selecting the photographs that go up on your Instagram? That's exactly what's happening if they don't vote. So you need to turn those guys out to vote. So now I'm open for questions. I went a little long. Oh, thanks so much. <laughs> Thanks so much, Malcolm. And I want you to know we are so agree in agreement with you about getting out the vote. We are um, we've we've gone to over um, 900 study abroad programs around the world, and mm -hmm. um, it's one of our major focuses. So, thank you. I I really thank you so much for your encouragement. It's so great to hear for our, all, all of our <laughs> My members. My pleasure. So, um, uh, I know that our members have lots of questions for you. We're going to sure. start with a few that people have emailed in, but I okay. also want to invite everyone online to put your questions in the Q&A box, okay? And Angela, would you like to ask the first question? Yes, I would. Um, my question is, why do you think that the Republican Congress and Senate don't want to do anything about the Russian uh, interference in our elections? Great question. I, I think the Republicans, out of fear of their base, the base has been co-opted. Donald Trump has just bought the conservative base lock, stock, and barrel. Uh, you know, there was a study out in, um, I think it was Lehigh County, no, Luzanne County, Pennsylvania, just recently. A guy stayed there for the last 18 months and studied them. They have the highest percentage of Trump voters. They have almost abject, you know, Appalachian poverty there. And they just love that he's just sticking it to people. They love that he's, you know, quite obviously that he's an open racist. It's not about economics. These are the, you know, I'll give you a civil war analogy. My family has served in uh, the armed forces every war since the civil war. And my great, great grandfather and his brother ran away from a plantation to join the 111 U.S. colored troops 
to fight in the Tennessee River Valley, right? That's motivation. So these people are the equivalent of the slave owners' foremans who didn't own slaves, but someday might. And these people, you know, as, as somebody once put it, they're, they're all millionaires who are down on their luck. And they think that they're going to reap the benefits of tribalism. And that tribalism will get them health care, not the black people. Will get them, you know, universal, you know, education and not the Latinos. This is just a openly racist, you know, belief system in which they believe the benefits and fruits of America should only go to them. It's just pure blatant tribalism. Look, and people say, oh, you're a black guy. That's what you believe. Hey. If I saw this in Burundi, I would be writing this in my intelligence report, okay, that the Hutus, all right, are planning on uh, isolating the Tutsis, you know, and of course, the next step is genocide. I'm not saying that's going to happen with us, because we have a way, way, way many more guardrails of democracy, and we're all here to motivate the most important guardrail of democracy, which is, right, redress of government through elections. So that's what these people are, and the Republican congressmen and senators are now reflecting their base and i think internally they always were the same people they just did not want to say it out loud it was politically incorrect but now it's not politically incorrect it's just incorrect the politics it's politically rewarding for them to be openly racist so you know that's why they are going along with their base you know um you know, one last little joke I'll make. I said this yesterday. I was at Politicon. I was interviewed by Henry Winkler, the Fonz. For those of you who remember the old show, Happy Days, big fan uh, of mine. <laughs> and, you know, I said, this is, this, is like, this is like the movie Caddyshack, for those of you who remember it. This is what would happen if, if the, 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 the jerk, you know, owner of the of Bushmills Golf Club, Judge Smells, became president. Okay. And now he makes all the decisions about your life and everybody else in the golfing country club are the people that control your destiny because you were too stupid and too lazy not to vote. So next question. Thanks. Go ahead, Cuthbert. Who's next? Cuth Cuthbert. Okay, we'll okay, go. Can ahead. you hear me now? Okay. Yes, we can. I hear you. Okay, good. Uh, I have one question. Uh, I'm not sure, or a couple of questions actually, real quick. Uh, I wasn't sure if this has been resolved or not, but the FBI with James Comey reopened its investigation of Hillary Clinton's emails about a week before the uh, mm -hmm. November 2016 election and then closed it again a few days before the election. And, and right. uh, many think that this is what uh, destroyed her chances of winning because she was leading in the polls up to that is there but there was a strange thing the way it was reopened just mm -hmm. you know a week or, or or 10 days before is there any su thing to suggest that something else happened with uh with russia in that period uh, i know i know it was it was suggested that it was because of emails they discovered on anthony uh weiner Weiner right. weiner's uh, uh laptop but is there more behind it than than that you know i i, I know people I know people that know Jim Comey. I've read Jim Comey's books. I've heard his comments. And I think the, the Republicans have mastered the politics of, of personal pressure. And in fact, if, when you put it all together, I think that she was done by the time that they got to the Comey announcement. I really think she was done. Uh, they had already manipulated the 77,000 people, uh, former un uh, all union people, former Obama voters in Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, wherever, they were already on the Trump train. We just didn't see it. Uh, that almost exclusively, 150 million people, mainly in these states that supported Trump, were seeing massive amounts of Russian propaganda. And that same propaganda magnified by Cambridge Analytica, which was a Steve Bannon, Jared Kushner, and Mercer created organization that may and is now under investigation for being the amplification or the slingshot for Russian intelligence, not to mention WikiLeaks. So I, let, let me tell you something. I was the first person in US news media to go on TV on July 25th, the morning that Bernie Sanders 
followers were having their, you know, their tantrum and walking out. And I said, the United States is under attack by a wide ranging cyber warfare attack being run by Russian intelligence designed to split the Democratic Party in half and to elect Donald Trump president. I said that I was the first person and I was laughed at. <laughs> and uh, two years later, uh, you know, 25 months later, we're still investigating it because that's exactly what happened. But no, uh, you know, the Comey thing is just one thing. And in what was a tidal wave, a multi-year effort that we now know began in 2012 to elect Donald Trump president. Next victim. So our Thanks. next question comes from uh, <laughs> one of our audience members, Brene. And Renee asks, uh, how do you feel about Donald Trump openly taking on the nationalist mon moniker? Yeah. Wow. That was yesterday, right? Donald Trump is essentially, he, listen, I want everyone who can hear the sound of my voice or see this video to stop using the word dog whistle. Okay. These people are using truck portable megaphones to say that they are white supremacists. And Donald Trump adopted the phrase nationalist, which is one step away. I mean, from saying white nationalist, which is essentially neo-Nazi, okay? I, it's just utter, he knows what he's saying. He uses the phrase nationalist now as a substitute for patriot, okay? And, uh, you know, it's just blatant. Listen, I have some advice for all of you. Whoops, sorry about that again. It's, it's hard being out in public. I'm, I'm, I, I wasn't where I was supposed to be. I'm at the lovely University of Pennsylvania Hospital broadcasting here today, but, it's, it's, it's very difficult to, um, to, to, ex to not see what's going on with people like Donald Trump and, and to keep your mouth shut. And that's why I'm suddenly so popular on television. Um, I'm an old Navy chief. I have no ability to keep my mouth shut when I see something's wrong, morally wrong, fundamentally wrong, or personally wrong, right? And in this case, this is wrong. And when you hear and see people that see, say this type of stuff, I don't care what you do. You got to get out there and you got to make your voice heard. Get on Twitter and write back, you're, an, you're a racist, okay? Nationalism, you're just calling yourself out as a white supremacist. We really appreciate that. It's when people don't speak, right? It's when good men don't speak that evil is committed, right? This is something that we have to stand up to. And Donald Trump is just telling you all, screw you. He only runs the United States for his base, 37% to 40% of the nation. He could not give two flips about the rest of you, but it's incumbent upon you to exercise your first amendment right to redress against, well, in this case, King George the fourth or King Donald the first, whatever you want to call him. Next question. Thanks, Christina. Do you want to go with your question? Uh, yes, hi. Um, I'm wondering, have you seen any other form of interference in our democracy or elections, for example, from the Middle East or from the East? Yeah, yeah, we, yes, we have. You know, I, my, my next book is coming out and it's about the Trump team. And people ask me, well, how can you blame everything on the Russians? You have these, these things that, you know, plans that were with Eric Prince that were coordinated out at the Seychelles that might have involved the Saudis, the Emiratis, even the Israelis. My philosophy about what happened is very simple. Donald Trump was promised the presidency. And they said, if you do every dirty trick in the book, no one's ever going to catch you. And when you become president, no one can hold you accountable because you've won. You're masters of the universe. I will, we will find, and I've said this many times on television, that there are, were multiple dirty tricks teams involved in this multiple teams one you know russia a russia b russia c israeli a israeli b saudi emirati all of these teams were being coordinated apparently by michael flynn uh and that's where almost all of them have him at the center of it the former director of defense intelligence agency somebody who would have handled missions like this before but michael flynn is now a witness for the prosecution so it is going to end up badly when all of this information comes out and we essentially find that, yeah, the main act of rhetorical treason was being carried out by cooperating with the Russians, but we're gonna find out that they worked with anybody who would do any dirty trick 
that would damage Hillary Clinton, they were in. This will be, well, I'm going to tell you what I tell everybody, right? This is the single greatest corruption scandal in the history of the United States. Remember when we were kids, I used to talk about Teapot Dome, right? The imaginary naval oil reservoir where they just took the money and divided it up. <laughs> that thing is going to pale in comparison. Um, by the way, for those of you who are in London, every time I go to London, I try to make a point of going to Benedict Arnold's tomb and spitting on it. Well, not this time. I didn't have enough time with Donald Trump's corruption to give, go out there and give Benedict Arnold his due. I will tell you this. I actually said this on Hardball with Chris Matthews. This nation is headed to a Benedict Arnold moment to where when it's done, he will be seen as he, we will praise his patriotism in the Battle of Saratoga much more than we will ever praise Donald Trump. Donald Trump will have a black shroud over his presidential portrait in the White House. I really hope that's true. Um, uh, the next question is from Jane DeSesa. She's one of our audience members and she says- Where's she at? Um, she didn't say, but she can tell us in the chat box. And she says, okay. you consider our current USA government a true democracy or is it more of a corporate oligarchy given the Citizens United decision? Okay, are you talking about before Donald Trump or are you talking about presently? You know, just, you, Citizens United did essentially unleash the oligarchy kraken, to use a, a turn of a phrase. But you know what? Of course it's still a democracy. We are a constitutional republic. And I get this crazy question from right-wingers all the time. We're not a democracy. Yes, you are, you idiots. A republic is a democracy in which the rights of the minority party are protected. Um, yes, we are still a democracy. But I will tell you frankly, you know what? Whatever you thought about America before this, good, bad, right or wrong, whether it's the man has been getting down on us or whatever, get it out of your head, okay? Things have not yet gone bad. And we are at the point where things will go very, very bad, very, very soon. You will beg, you will wish to God for the times that you thought a real democracy, that America wasn't a democracy. We're talking about a presidency that has challenged that all powers are in the hands of the president, where he can defy laws and rewrite them with a Congress and a Supreme Court that will validate anything he says, okay? You know, a little, little homework for you. If, if you think it was bad before, you need to go watch the movie Judgment at Nuremberg with Spencer Tracy, right? That trial that's being carried out in that movie of the Nazis was a Nazi Supreme Court that validated all of Hitler's laws, okay? That's where we're moving to, especially when you have a, con a House, a Senate, and a Supreme Court, and a judiciary that will no longer execute the laws the way that they have been executed for 243 years. They will rubber stamp what a petulant little dictator wants. So... Back then, not so bad. Future could be awful. Next question. <laughs> Go ahead, Angela. One more. I got. I got to head out okay. here. Guys. All right. My my question is actually from Adrian Johnson from the UK. Uh, she's in the audience now. Um, have you? I'm sorry. You have said you consider protection of voter rolls and national security a uh, national security priority. What yeah. steps should have been taken to protect against hacking and potential associated voter purges? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, you know, you, you have to understand something. We, with regards to the U.S. Intelligence Committee, Department of Homeland Security under the Obama administration, uh, and the president and his staff himself, no one thought that another nation would have the audacity, audacity to interfere with our elections. And technically, they didn't. What they did was they did not go after the voting rolls themselves, okay? They scanned them. They checked them out. Believe me, I should know. It was the former director of the Association of Secretaries of States that actually contacted NBC and said, I was a liar because the state of Florida's voting rolls were scanned by Russian intelligence, and she denied it to the high heavens. Yeah, fast forward to the New York Times article and the admission by the governor of Florida that, yes, they were scanned by Russian intelligence. But that being said, we took all the measures that were due 
and a civil democracy operating as usual. The Russians were not, they were relying on us to operate as usual. What they, what they didn't rely on, or what they did rely on, was they relied on us to be Democrats, right? They relied on us to, to discuss, plan, hash out, and argue about what steps should be taken to protect our voter rolls, okay? What we didn't plan on is that we would have their appointed associate, right? Their witting asset, fundamentally leading this government to deny any protections to our voting systems for this election. That being said, the only way to ensure that nothing happens is to blow this damn vote margin out so wide that no matter what they do, they lose. And that can be done. And you know, I heard this again yesterday. I'm gonna emphasize it one more time, okay? Because 65% of people age 38 and above or higher are voting in this election. Only 16% of 18 to 29 year olds are voting in this election. If we get them to vote at 20%, at 25%, the margins will be so wide, you will have a 70 seat Democratic lead over the Republicans. That's veto proof majority. And we can start figuring out what the hell happened, start enacting laws, controlling the spending and getting America back to what it was. You are talking our language. Thank you so much, Malcolm. <laughs> My pleasure. Really, really a pleasure. And I want to also thank the audience and Angela for making this happen. Guys, look, if you have not gotten your ballot yet, please get in touch. We really need you to vote this year. You've heard from Malcolm why it's so important. We're all on the same page here. Malcolm, Can I make one more statement? Yes, hit please. those hit those schools up, the Lisees, the yep. American schools. Get out in front of those dang things, all right? Uh, you know, I used to hang out at the American School of Abu Dhabi. Get out there, find out who's 18. Get those votes in. And military people, those guys don't vote very well, all right? That's right. That's right. We're, we're on it. Thanks so much, So and uh, all right. That's you. absolutely my pleasure. All right, y'all, everyone uh, take care. And if you need some help voting, go to GOTV at DemocratsBroad.org or VoteFromAbroad.org. All right. Bye-bye. Bye, Malcolm. Thanks. Thank well, thanks everyone for joining. And uh, did you enjoy? <laughs> do you enjoy the Democrats Abroad webinars? Uh, we do too, and we'd love to keep this conversation going. Help us run future webinars by making a donation. If you'd like to help uh, support these calls, consider making a do donation at democratsabroad.org slash donate. And then again, one last final reminder for anyone who is still looking for their ballot. We've got a great help desk. Um, you can go to votefromabroad.org uh, and use the chat there or email us at gotv at democratsabroad.org. Um, thanks again for joining us and we look forward to seeing you on the next web WebEx. <laughs>